Welcome to the Morse Code Podcast, where we talk with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. My name is Corby, and I'm hoping these conversations inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just starting out on your own creative odyssey. We wanted to do something special this week, and I dare say, I think we might have delivered. It's our first two guest show, twin brothers Nathan and Judd Epting, who both paint in the style known as plein air. That's where you set up your easel on location and paint what you see, right there in the landscape with the changing light and conditions evolving moment to moment. I kick off the conversation telling the story of how I met these Nashville gems, so I won't get into that here. What I will say is that I loved talking with these true artists and was moved by their discipline as well as their humility in terms of their approach to finding and developing their own personal voices through the painting medium. They're a common sight here in Nashville and especially East Nashville, where you can find them at farmer's markets, out on sidewalks, or as was the case for me, in front of your own house. A quick note, toward the end of this conversation, we pull up several of their paintings so they can comment and discuss what they were trying to accomplish and whether or not they felt they'd succeeded. I was careful to make this translate without visual aid, but if there were an episode of the Morse Code podcast you might want to watch, this is that one. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please like and subscribe to us on your favorite platform. And now, here's my conversation with Nathan and Judd Epting. Nathan and Judd Epting, thank you guys for making some time for us. Howdy, howdy. I'm really hey, excited hey. to talk to you about all things. I mean, we've only hung out a few times, but um, it's they've been memorable, to say the least. And uh, you guys are known as the Plain Air Ramblers. That's the name of the band, we'll call it. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how known we are, but that's that's kind no, of... No, you're, you're known. <laughs> you're getting knowner and knowner. We got together and the police weren't called. That was another thing. <laughs> Well, I thought maybe we'd kick it off by how I how we all met, which was um, it was a couple mornings ago, maybe in the summer. I look out my window and there's just some guy setting up some on the sidewalk, which, you know, in East Nashville, it's not unheard of. But um, then an easel came up and um, I was like, what is going on? And then I saw an accomplice across the street and I texted my buddy whose truck seemed to be the object of attention. Uh, who lives behind us uh, or has a studio behind us. And I was like, did you ask some people to paint your truck? And I, he, that guy couldn't get, Nick's his name. He couldn't got, come out to the sidewalk faster. Cause he thought painting your truck meant somebody was coming out and with a can of spray paint. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there was, you guys were out there and um, plain air painting is a style of painting. This probably is common knowledge to people listening to the podcast, but um, where you paint freehand just right there as you see it and um, getting to know you guys, you've made a bit of a habit of this, not just in East Nashville, but everywhere in the area. And um, I just am talking to you that day. Not only are you um, talented in interested in the arts but something uh you know a lot of local lore uh right or wrong um and and so i thought maybe we could just talk a little bit about both sure sure yeah we're uh this pandora's box uh yeah i don't know what's gonna happen here kind of get us started it's one thing rolls and leads to another well maybe we could start with how did you did you come to painting late or how did this like you guys are twins Right. And but you didn't always paint together. This isn't a, a lifelong I think like obsession. most uh, children you kind of when you're a child you have a develop uh, you develop a visual language. A lot of children will you know get a hold of pencils or markers or whatever kind of thing and start going to work drawing what they see, their favorite characters or or something out of TV or books. And, sure. And a lot of people they move on from that. Some people uh, in, ends up becoming vocation, and uh, a lot of people, it's it's kind of a sideline interest or hobby or something like that. So it has been a thing that's been picked up and put down at different times. We both work different jobs, different careers, and um, something that there were times in my life. Uh, where I would I would think to myself that you know if I do have an opportunity to pursue this more mm-hmm. so is part of uh, both of our educations mm-hmm. so studied Form, formally speaking 
Yes, formally. Yeah. So studied art more on the commercial side mm-hmm. and um, just wound up. You're exposed to so many different things, so many different avenues to the point of confusion. I'd imagine. Um, everybody you're around is confused and there's a lot of uh, mimicry. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, you, you'll ha- you kind of shape shift. Everybody's kind of goes through different phases and um I remember we had a lot of people. It was like, you know, anime and, you know, manga, different things where people are drawing monsters or whatever. But I took a painting class where mm-hmm. it was an elective class where I had to be in a studio for three hours every time we met. And really the first day I walked in and, and started painting, it was like, man, this is just it. I mean, and how old were you then? Oh, I was 25. Okay. Yeah, so, so 25 years old. And so you can have... You work in different medias and everything, and this was um, oil paint and just drawing from a still life. Mm-hmm. And just clicks. You know, you could tell that there's people around you that absolutely hate it. They'd rather be working with something else, you know. But with that, it was starting to get into books and go to museums and galleries and and uh, just look at all the different schools and movements of paintings. Mm-hmm. And Judd, did you have a similar trajectory? Or well, yeah, I, I did. I think the um, the thing that always kind of comes back to me is that drawing and, and crayons, painting when you're a child—that's your first language, anyone's first language. It's universal. Uh, if a child can get a hold of something to make a mark, um, they don't understand the language and the intri- intricacy of all everything going on around in the conversation, and they're picking up a lot visually. Hmm. And that was me. And uh, our folks are came off the farm, kind of agrarian background. Our father is very good with numbers and finance. And uh, I always compared myself to him looking up when I was coming up. And and uh, that was kind of understood. You're going to do something. We had a great uncle who was an attorney in, in Mississippi. And he said, "I'll with his kids, I'll pay for law school i'll pay for medical school and that's it or engineering maybe and so um there's a lot of limitations there you know you feel like and um and then but you do growing up at our time you grow up with the idea that and you're told that you can do anything and be anything and that's exciting but it's also it can be kind of paralyzing daunting yeah that's right so um, I was probably I was went to college and uh, and and dropped out and came back to Nashville and worked in a warehouse and uh, was around uh, the music thing the whole my whole life and that and uh, sure wish I had musical talent I sure have an ear for ever all the wonderful sounds but it was that time I started drawing at night to just to pass time. Hmm. And it just kind of people saw that, whoa, you've got something there. And a lot of encouragement and uh, started taking classes at night part time. And then it kind of took off. Yeah. I mean, like when you were saying how it's wonderful to be encouraged that you can do anything you want from a parent or a, 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 a figure of authority, mm-hmm. uh, it is daunting. And one of the ways I think that especially as a creative person, you do find your way is through people around you sort of pointing out something that you don't know about yourself just yet. So I want, that sounds like that was part of your, your path. I mean, I have my own version of that Mm -hmm. and you kind of notice like, Oh, this is, maybe there is something here and and you kind of follow that down. Um, I think that one of the reasons is your story is so interesting because you guys have had like a journey of, you know, your own journeys, but then now that you've got, have come, you're like thrown in together sort of. So, mm-hmm. uh, and we can, we can skip around a little bit, but I'm curious, like, what does that look like? You guys, first of all, I see you around town all the time. If you um, follow, <laughs> yeah. if people follow you guys on, um, uh, you have your own Instagram. I do. Yeah, it's uh, just my name, Nathan Epting. Nathan Epting. And then, are you on it? J? I am. Okay. J J W Epting, our last name, and uh, that's that's I'm at that. So you're at that, and you mm-hmm. po- you guys post all the time. You yeah. like your paintings of the day, and so you're clearly you're you're painting. It seems like on a daily basis. This is like a full time job for you. Right, guys. right. Yeah. And occasionally you get knocked off um, 
off the horse a little bit just by like around the holidays or you'll go through a season where weather's really bad or just uh, I'll, I'll also work on commissions. So I'll be doing things that are not entirely related to plein air painting. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people look at plein air like this is kind of like um, this is kind of like the woodshed. I mean, you just go and you woodshed, do this, and it informs what you might do, you know, with illustration, um, all different different disciplines in art. Um, people come out and plan air. But a lot of people, they'll do more of a hybrid version. And with me, it's just, I just go sketch it. And yeah. I don't, I don't go into post-production. It's kind of like I try to edit and do everything on site within two and two and a half maybe three hours Mm -hmm. and is your do you just have tons of canvases at your house in storage or (laughs) yeah we do we've had uh i mean we've had days where it's 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 rip it and shred it days oh yeah it's kind of like after tax season where people are, are are shredding all their tax so there's a lot of things that's um what hiding the bodies what doesn't sell or what doesn't there's some things that like well i want to use that for inspiration to a piece later on so you kind of know you have an inventory in your mind Mm -hmm. but there's a great painter here in uh, middle tennessee jason saunders does wonderful work and i think he's kind of like the top dog here Mm. but uh, i went in the studio one day and i'm like man there's this thing it's built looks like a stage it's kind of high in the back corner of the studio and i was like man what's that do you ever play music on that he's like no that's where i put all my crap work it's just uh and he said, and it's got a like a, it's almost like a table with a, a mm-hmm. spread over it. And he's like, don't lift that up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it neither with yeah. Jason. Really don't. But it's, um, yeah, you do have, um, you have misfires I and mean, you have days where it's like you're just seeing it, man. It's just like, you know. And I, oftentimes for me, like if I have a period like Thanksgiving, I didn't get out and paint much at all. But I almost anticipate like the next time I get a good break to go paint it's going to go better than normal exactly because you're, you're chomping at the bit chomping at the bit yeah, yeah. There, so there's time off you need know, more time to reflect and i we that happens almost every time if you take a few days it's you come early, back early on when you're painting you'll have successes and you'll have days where it's like man i really love this and and you'll get a perspective on your work where it's like you, you're almost too close to it and then two years later you'll look back and you'll be like that's a dog you know i mean Mm. but um i would say i would say not all days are equal and sometimes you're like man what circumstances you know is it phase of the moon or i don't don't know what's going on you know yeah i i mean i you know regardless of the outlet of the the effort (laughs) um i think that's a necessary component of the creative experience right i know that i feel that way i mean i i Two, I'm I'm at it daily. You know, right now I'm in a writing phase. So it's writing every day, and try to put in a thousand words. And I mean, I'm in a, I'm having a weird time right now because like confidence is not happening. Oh, and I can totally relate. You know, and it's just like part of the work is just trusting that you're not a complete moron. That you know <laughs> you do have some knack for this based on some. <laughs> previous perhaps imagined success in the past and that you know you can push on through hoping that you'll have a good day sooner than later hopefully yep but um so I, i'm not surprised at all to hear that right and um also to your bit about not doing it uh for a few days and how it kind of you save up this sort of excitement or something some latent energy for it i noticed that um there's times in chapters of my life when i'm playing a lot of music and practicing a lot I'll, I'll i'll have days where i'm working out a song over and over again and then there if i don't do that for a week there's some i'm there's something in my body and mind that's practicing still and then when i come right. back to it i'm so much better at it um and that's a little bit mysterious but just to your point i i, I can connect to that i was a commercial driver for eight and a half years and there was a uh, a lot of times I would see things out the windshield that just certain the way things connected, the way lines came together and it would it would I would think about how would I paint that. Mm. So it's yeah. you, you always see the if you're a songwriter, you see the world through those eyes and those ears. And Absolutely. You, you hear a phrase or something like that. So with, with painting it's um 
a lot of times it'll be the time of day or it'll just be when when we first met that day i drove past the end of your street and i happened to glance up the street i'm in a habit of doing that and i I saw the truck out there and uh, old chevy pickup truck and i'm like you know stand on the brakes <laughs> I, this, the, I could tell you so many stories of getting in a car with him and ending up in over on the plateau or something or somewhere way far flung and uh, we have days like that where we don't we it's just you don't get much done but it's kind of we we call it scouting trips but you're you know? you're having conversation you're talking about what you see you're talking about other things in life and it's it's a part of of filling the tank Mm-hmm. Uh, so to speak and uh so but that day was good it was a really good day and it, and every, we just meet people like you and nick and you know it, it was his truck mm-hmm. and uh boy it's just rich uh that experience and uh yeah, there's a socially expansive component to it that's right it's it sort of a surprise that's right bonus. And, and we talked about it that day considering the the last couple of years with the pandemic and everything that had happened and uh, it's just been for us being out, and it's it's almost like we've been spared a lot of the experience a lot of people have had. Yeah, because of that. And outside, isolated. I really went back to painting right at the beginning of the pandemic. I was driving a truck, and I got these weird symptoms, and I gave a two week notice. Mm. And at the same time, I I they were like, take whatever time you need for getting well. I got back, drove a little bit more, but. I was like, this is the time I'm going to go paint. So really, people ask, how long you've been painting? And I always ask them, well, right now, today, here, you know, or mm-hmm. I, I went back in earnest real early in the pandemic, maybe mm-hmm. a month, six weeks in, and I didn't really have a pandemic. I mean, I just was outside by myself painting, and uh, I never felt a lot of the isolation that other people feel. Mm-hmm. Because for me, and for I think a lot of painters, it is a solitary kind of pursuit. You know, mm-hmm. you, you are kind of by yourself and you're in your own mind a lot. Mm-hmm. So I think people that had the creative side, you know, you have to be fed by social interaction. But for me, it was not a rough time, mm-hmm. not a rough time at all. Yeah, that's probably partly I'm, I'm guessing that you're a bit on the introverted side. Yeah, I can um, be. Yeah, yeah. Are you, Chad, are you an introvert or extrovert, do you know? I would like to be an introvert, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, Few I, proud. Get, get me a couple of cups of coffee, like, which I had this morning, and I'm, I'm going to go. Yeah. And if I'm on the right side of my brain, there's no telling what's going to come out, and, it, and it's, it's all run on, every, yeah, so... Well, um, I don't want to alienate the listeners among us, but uh, I thought that we'd do something different than we've done in the past, which is um, maybe throw a couple paintings up on a screen and you can tell us about it. And Kyle, if you, do you have that truck handy? Um, so if you're, I guess if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this. This is the day that I met Nathan and Judd. This is right out in front of our house here in East Nashville. And that's my friend Nick's Chevy. Um, and that's, that is Nathan's painting Correct. i'm guessing I'm yeah that's one one of my children <laughs> yeah that was uh i i go a long time between finding like subjects that i really really like you know there's a lot of times it's just well this i i'm gonna break down and do what i call a shape exercise and it's where you just start in one thing one part of the shape or the shapes fit together it's almost like working a puzzle mm. but there's a lot of improvisation in it but this truck, I was like, oh man, I just love the whole, the colors, the the rust and the patina on it and the fact that it's kind of like a survivor. Mm-hmm. So I love old cars like this. And uh, I'm not the only one. I've seen other painters that have approached this kind of thing. And I've been influenced by some really good painters out there. Mm-hmm. But this um, really goes back to a time, maybe when I was in my thirties, I was going out and finding old cars and junkyards and I would sit and either draw them or um, take a big board and paint them, try to paint them. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, my dad, my uncle restored old cars. So I would be taking, we'd be driving on a family trip and there'd be a junkyard and we'd go and he would always try to buy chrome parts for a 1960 Chevy that he was restoring at the time. 
So that kind of you're kind of you become a, a composite of all the different experiences in life and it feeds what you do and i should add that to that when we were small we were always if there was an antique store you stopped we had <laughs> yeah. no choice and this was before antique stores became gift shops and there was really cool old stuff americana so that that's informed a lot of the way a lot of things we're looking for if you can uh-huh. still find them like he said survivors and there's a portrait in that. And this is this painting you did is probably an hour, hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah, it'll be two hours. Something like that. No more than two. So you're that's uh that's what comes out. I think you were you actually were nice enough to let me I set up the, my little phone camera on time lapse behind you. So on the on my Instagram is yeah, you, that's right. you painting that painting um condensed into about to three minutes it's kind of like those scenes on gilgan's island where they're running around i don't know if you remember speed. those yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe date myself but everything's going fast well and you've come back to paint that truck i think a few times oh yeah oh yeah i have and um it's just um yeah a lot of times a lot of the old painters you know when you think about monet they painted the same object in different light different angles so um I guess it's a fixation we get. Well, yeah, I was going to say it's not the same truck, right? Every single time, you not, every, not every time, every and day. it's you're not constrained to to like. I mean, there's people that do complete total realism, but you have editorial privilege. Anything you do, so you can take something out or leave it in. Anything that bothers you, or um, there's just a lot of things that you learn. You know, that 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 an approach to simplify. So there's another name I would give you is Ann Blair Brown um, Mm -hmm. is a local painter and Nashville native. And uh, she's a good person to probably include a link for, but she's like the queen of simplification Mm -hmm. and really getting essence of things Mm -hmm. and having an eloquent way of expressing visual ideas. So um, that's people like that influence me a lot because I'm more of a guy that goes for the throat and tries to include everything I could get. I had an instructor in college that would lean over and say Civil War battlefield because he's, he'd pull out a book and there'd be a lithograph of this, uh, you know, people up here with bayonets and people firing a cannon and thousands of people. So he was always doing that with everybody, like you're taking on way too much. The, the comment being you inc- don't include everything. Don't include everything yeah. and, and find a way um, because visual ideas, people are inundated with visual, you know, audio and visual but but people um something about simplicity arrest people Mm -hmm. so if you see like old poster design is a good a good thing to reflect on you know if you like the classic posters that um it's really not as big a thing now but it used to be yeah and and, uh i mean that's part of the the appeal of hatch and hatch definitely in general yeah to have an iconic kind of um flair to things instead of including too many elements and then you end up with having to reconcile one thing to another civil war battlefield yeah um that, man I, it's so interesting my mind just immediately goes to writing because that's one of the things that you struggle with as a writer or have to grapple with uh, is that what to leave in and what to leave out mm-hmm. and um it's very interesting i think you know i'm a compulsive journal writer and I think a big reason for that is that it's the lowest pressure. You know, it's very, it's, it's permissive. No one's ever going to read it. I don't even read the things. Um, and it's just it went under that uh, lack of constraint. What you end up writing is what your mind naturally seeks out in the life around you, which is uh, itself very instructive. And then um, it makes it easier for me to when I'm doing a little bit more formal writing or writing that may have an audience at some point um, to trust the thing that I taught myself in the journal writing and just go with that and be like, okay, that's what you do. Um, Cause it is dang it's, it is really like, you can go, what does that character look like? Well, how tall are they? What, how, how old are they? What's their background? What's it like instead of just a few breath strokes mm-hmm. and sometimes that's yep. plenty enough. Um, so do you feel like you're better at picking and choosing and leaving out? Uh, it's, it's still something I struggle with. And I think uh, the idea is to suggest things. And um, if you look at, and, and I'm like wild about the old Russian impressionist. That's mm. one of my most 
influential kind of uh, sources, and they would suggest things. So it would, I mean, when you glance at it, I mean, it it, it looks like a lot of movement, a lot of moving parts, but um, there's, I mean, it could be a man on a bicycle running down, the, going down the street. You don't even see the bike when you really look at the painting, but when you glanced at it, you're like, visually, my eyes put together. So like in writing, you know, you, you're trusting whoever's reading what you're writing if it's if it's a work of fiction or if it's you're trying to establish actual facts is that that people have a mind enough to put things together yes that's the, i mean that's what you learn with experience yep. is trusting your reader to be more intelligent than you think that they might be at first that's right pitch. that's right and i've heard songwriters say that they've written songs and it became somebody you know it became their song um something else they what do you mean by that it. That it, it uh, they they found something in the song that the songwriter didn't even intend. Mm. It was just something that that they they suggested something, and it took somebody to a place or an event or a person in their in their mind in their yeah. in their life. And so I think that happens a lot in poetry for sure. You can mm-hmm. get that um, or movies even too. The movies yep. that aren't like ex- expressly um, solid or uh, I think of Hitchcock. Yeah, element you know, of mystery, element yep. of mystery, yep. or or suggestion, or mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I like I like for songwriting. I do like a great story song that just serves it right up to you. You know, I think about I was thinking about this yesterday. I have my musical roots are really um, spotty. My parents weren't fans of music except for church. They were real churchgoers. So. I still think that what I do comes out of the freaking Nazarene hymnal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, but my, but this, there were songs that came across and, um, there's still one to this day, this John Denver song called grandma's feather bed that um, yeah, yeah, when we ever get together as a family, me and my dad and my little brother would spontaneously sing the entire song. And, um, I sang it to myself yesterday. I was making the bed and I'm just like, damn, that's a good song. <laughs> it's just like, it just spells it all out for you. It's so yeah. charming and easy to like. And I love that kind of song, but I also like Elliot Smith and just these like really non-linear um they're kind of painting songs you know they're just in uh, there's something so tender and vulnerable and unpredictable about that approach to uh, to songwriting where the user the 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 maker himself doesn't quite even know what's going on Mm -hmm. there's not there's less of an intent and i think i wonder if that's more akin to you know this style of painting that we might be talking about if just uh um, leaving room for interpretation. There's uh, a lot of parallels mm-hmm. with that. There sure are. So, okay. So on a daily basis, you're out there painting. How do you guys, what does that look like? Practically speaking? I mean, you send a text to each other, you call each other, Hey, let's go out to, well, usually I'm in, we're in my car. So it's like, if you're going, I'm going right now. So it's most of the time, you, if you see me by myself, it's because he missed the bus. And I'm hanging on for dear life when I do make, <laughs> when I do make the bus. <laughs> But um, it's uh, it's very spontaneous. Uh-huh. Manic, the more spontaneous, manic. the better. It's manic. He's he hates it. But um, for me, I it's the more spontaneous, the better. And there's so many like the best days. You're like I couldn't have imagined doing what I just did. When, like when I woke up, I had no idea I was going to do find the subject that I did. Other other times, I'll see something and I'll know. You know, I'll know. Like next Thursday, it looks like it's going to be mid 60s and sunny, partly cloudy. And uh, that thing I drove past, I want to go, you know, see if I can talk to the owner or whatever. And uh, so that that's that's it's it's a little too loose sometime for him. But uh, for me, it's like I if, you know, days when I get out by myself or no offense, it's you know, there's there's a freedom to kind of never know what you're going to get into. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the, I mean, a big part of this approach to your version of painting is, um, I just, it's so it stands in stark contrast to like studio painting where it's a pretty controlled right. environment. You show up there to, this is like a little bit wild out there. It is. It's good. Let's see what happens. Let's have an adventure. Painting's part of it, but not all of it. Right. And I think my work, I mean, to a lot of people like this, there's, there's all different kind of painting, you know, there's very minimal, there's abstract, and um, for for a lot of people, like my work looks really controlled. But the actual making of the work is is you start with abstraction. Yeah, I remember in the in the um, con- 
time lapse. What is that mm-hmm. called? Uh, just watching that happen in real time, where it's just like it's not it's nothing for a very long time. Right. It's just like it's abstract as hell at the beginning, yeah. and then only at the very end, it's like, oh, whoa, that is like the patina on the truck. I've heard people talk about it like it's carving. You're carving out an image, but mm-hmm. um, there's all different ways to express it. But a lot of painters, like both of us, you end up becoming more of an abstract and expressionist painter because you end up kind of breaking free from mm-hmm. the constraints because it, you know, it, you, you begin to get more and more creative. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the possibility of that happening is there, you know, it's, you paint long enough. And, yeah. uh, I see a lot of people have done that and I've seen people that have gone way out and then returned. But and the main thing back with them when yeah. they did. So yeah, for great. sure. I, mm-hmm. Yeah, impossible not to. I, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you just. Uh, I don't, I've known a lot of different kind of painters. I still do, and fellowship with a lot of different people that have very different ideas about painting and art. And uh, I like all different kind of schools. I mean, to some degree. But for me, I reference the Russian impressionist. But there's American schools of painting, like regional painters that that I've looked at a lot. And if you look at like a Hopper, I think most most planner painters look at Hopper and the sense of light that he gets in his painting, but also the design, which is is always been kind of like a clay feet for me is like design because I'm usually I don't know where to put something on there. I just I want to paint that object or, you know, and so if there's anything that that I, I've worked towards and work on is the idea of like slowing down at the beginning and not working mm. so fast mm. and considering considering like composition, composition like where to put the the object that you're right. going to paint in the frame and some people have really strong sense of composition it's mm. like everything they do it's like it it makes sense it's like but then i know i took a workshop two years ago and for some reason that week i was putting things in the middle like unconsciously doing it and um the man, I, uh, Joe Gerzik, his last name's kind of hard to smell, spell. It's a Hungarian name, but he was like, are you consciously making a decision to do this? And it's like, it, he really kind of opened my eyes to like, what are you, are you really thinking, you know? And mm-hmm. Keep the thought process involved. Mm-hmm. I ask him this all the time. What are you thinking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you thinking? But he I mean, listens to Joe but Gerzik. The worst thing, the worst thing you can do is to, is to have a great painting day and then have a design element that is just, once it's pointed out to you, or if you realize it like three-fourths of the way through, you're like, oh my goodness, there's something that really bothers me here. Yeah. And it's there i mean it's like you may you may it's like that mississippi leg hound you just go ahead and let it finish it's at that point yeah you may have you may have been very eloquent in other parts of the painting and there might be one element like i've never painted better or more concisely than this one thing but then there's a there's a utility pole in the middle you know yeah that's going top to bottom and and not that you have to include that you know but Mm -hmm. it's like at the time you thought well i want to put that there and you didn't think about it it's really funny. Like we, I was just thinking about what your professor said. You know, like, do you, are you meaning to do that? And he draw, drew your attention to like, oh, there's these unconscious choices yep. that I'm making. And then the the implication I think in his suggestion is like make choices, deliberate choices about what you do. Be intentional. And I be intentional with what mm-hmm. you do. And I totally relate to that. Um, musically and acting, be intentional is like fun is key. Um, but there's your it's more complicated than that because. There is also this surrender and to instinct, this yeah. trust involved in like a letting yourself be yourself. It's like the things that you do right. that aren't great or are, that could be better or, or aren't necessarily intentional um, are absolutely a part of who you are as an artist. You know, and that, that goes back to the academic people. Like I was describing a whole school of academic painters is that. At some point, these guys and in, 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 in ladies, they get so good with all the different, you know, um, elements, composition, design, tone, value. At some point, you get all that information and plein air painting allows you, it tests you mm-hmm. how much you know. It's like a pop quiz every time you set mm-hmm. up. Yeah. But you're not going to have the confidence when you start out. But at some point, you're gonna you're gonna have either a cloud rolling in, thunder starting to happen on a, on a day when you're just really, 
and you get limited to 20 minutes and 30 minutes. And sometimes I've seen people just do stuff that like, it, it's so crazy interesting. It's amazing. Whereas if they had two hours, they would have overstated it. Mm-hmm. They would have overworked it. And it would have um, had this this look to it that didn't, the spontaneity yeah. is, um, that's something that it can be forced upon people at times. And it's like, man, how much do you know? And how much can come out almost like explosively? Yeah. It's a clarifying right. opportunity, I, I, you know, I, I think. And um, it, it's almost like there's an aspect, and this isn't quite the right way to put it, but almost an aspect of performance to plein air painting, where in the sense that like, here it is at this moment under these conditions right now. It is. It is. You know, it's not a controlled environment. Yeah. It's, it's this time. So I know studio painters and I'm like, I try to coax them out. Like, why don't you go plein air painting? It's like, I think there's a fear of failure and, and that never goes away. I mean, it's always there. I think if people act on stage or act in front of cameras, it's like, and what I look like, you know, there's, you're, you're very self-conscious, but, um, we've painted a lot like in markets and there's a mm-hmm. farmer's market here in Nashville that we like to paint at. And it's, I mean, you have dogs fighting right behind you and you got people coming up and asking you questions. And then, you know, you're, you're very self-conscious. Like, how's this coming off? But people are so nice. Like most of all, all the time. Yeah. You hardly, every once yeah. in a while, you get some old retired guy that's like, well, I wouldn't do it that way. Or, <laughs> you know, or, oh, yeah. or, or the oh, you, get the, you get the Bob Ross impression a lot. And so for a musician, that's like somebody walking up, free bird. This reminds me of Lawrence Welk. Yeah. You know, and that, <laughs> Hope that I doesn't you happen. Get, you get, you get older retired men usually like how long if i stood out there would it take for you to paint me in your your picture <laughs> yeah <laughs> that kind of thing and it's funny how many it's like they're almost all the same like have they seen that in a movie or something i don't the, know the same comment yeah, over, same and over comment. Again, different guy yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but most hilarious. people are like really in and you meet really unique and interesting people are drawn out you know so yeah that's one of the great things is is no matter where we paint whether it's in nashville or out further away Usually we get invited places. We're like, well, can you come paint on my land or do something like that? So mm-hmm. it just leads doors open up, and um, and that's been that's been one of the great things because you never know what, what something small is going to lead to. Yeah, I mean, like we're here right now because of one of your adventures. Yeah, and mm-hmm. you know, I forgot to mention this earlier, but you guys played. Um, our spring fling that we have in our yep. front yard. You were kind enough to come by and do that and painted the crowd. And it's, it's a cherished um, family, <laughs> uh, family we, portrait, family yeah, If we hadn't painted in the markets, we never would have agreed to that. Cause it's mm-hmm. like, uh, it, we were like, we'd been painting like a bunch of Saturdays at the farmer's market out in West Nashville. And just based on that experience, like, oh, I know it's gonna be like really chaotic from a painting perspective, mm-hmm. but it's, it's like, no, it's, you know, there's so much improvisation you have to learn. And if you don't learn improvisation, then it's better to just I don't know, paint from a picture paint. Have you had any, uh, any adventures gone awry? Like, pro- yeah, shown up in property owners. There's didn't been some really? funny stuff. I was out in Wyoming. Uh, oh gosh, this is not the same epoch we're talking about. This is back before I even drove trucks. Um, but there was this place with a lot of old 40s and 50s cars that were rusting and just parked out in the field. So uh, I went and there's this this little uh, like a farmhouse looking situation. And I mean, every sign on this place was like, nobody's lived here for a long time. And, and I went and knocked on the door and I had this big glass pane in the door and I didn't pay attention to this little note there was like a, a little piece of paper that the glass had just sweated on, you know, with changing temperatures. Yeah. You couldn't read it. And I'm like, I don't know what that's supposed to be. I just knock, knock. Nobody came to the door. So I went down in the field and, and I set up. I was setting up my rig and I hear somebody uh, chamber a shell and a shotgun behind me, like 10 feet behind me. And I don't hear a voice yet. So I'm waiting for the voice. And I'm not like wanting to turn around, but this guy was, he was hard of hearing and um, he couldn't see well, but he had had people stripping stuff off of these old cars Mm. and getting like hood ornaments and stuff. So that's just not even close to a part of who I am. I'm like, I'm just here to paint. 
And he's like, paint what? You know, yeah. <laughs> as a sideline, people, you'll ask people, can I paint that old truck? And he'll, they'll say, what color? Yeah. You know, what color are you going to paint it? That was the first co- like, no, connotation no. that I got when I told Nick. Yeah. So, yeah. Why are they Pull out some truck? Krylon and start going. <laughs> but, we had uh, the one where, and I mean, you're often, you know, you're, you're on the street and everything and, and people are encountering everything. You're in Nashville in these changing neighborhoods. But we got one where the guy's like, I, here, and he gives us the loaves of bread. And it's like, what's this about? And he's like, I always give homeless people bread. <laughs> and uh, that was good. That's actually happened multiple times with the same guy. He, he, he'll he see us, and he'll stop his car and get out. And, and he... Really somehow, good bread. He somehow gets bread from the produce place out on Murphy Road. Yeah. And just super nice guy. And um, I had a guy in... Uh, where was I? I was in South Carolina down in the low country. And he said, do you like red or white? And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, wine, what do you like? And he brought me a bottle of red wine. It was a, like 95, 96 degree day. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he's a teetotaler. His paintings would be so much better. Yeah. You know I mean? Just <laughs> but I could it right there, man. Yeah, I was on a bike that day and I had this little, uh, like this little pull behind thing with all my gear in it. And I'm sitting here rattling this bottle of wine, sitting there going back to a uh, condo where I was staying. So, um, yeah, it was unusual. And you have things, uh, you have a lot of different, you know. We had one right around the corner where this old guy, he's, he's really sick. We just saw him this morning on the way, but mm-hmm. a friend of Elvis, personal friend, and Whoa. just brought us into his place. And they had. You, you knew him from before? How did you know No, this? we were just painting on the street. He was, and then we went back and painted over there. Had Andy Warhol paintings in his house of Real, Elvis. Yeah, yeah, oh, and uh, hit original art from um, Salvador Dali, a lot of Howard Finster, which if you're familiar with Finster, folk artist from North Georgia, hmm. house full of art. Thomas Hart Benton, I think. And, um, ended up buying a painting of mine and set it up in there with all. It just looks so bad. <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff sure, that's but he had a true. he had a bedroom suit for elvis's in the house in the elvis room huh and then he had this actually belonged to elvis on the wall a personal christmas card from elvis in 1959 he's in his military and then santa's over here and you look and that's tom parker is santa claus the cr- and it's that's just crazy yeah close friends got that and elvis was still in the military so. Unbelievable. And that's over here on the east side? Yeah, it's oh, right yeah. around the corner from Yeah, I won't give them away. But no. Yeah, yeah, that's we'll, we'll, we'll introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that's I mean, there's a piece of, there's something about you guys and what you're doing right now that it's just, um, uh, what is it? Stands in stark contrast to the, the brutal mechanization of modern life. And we all, I don't, maybe I'm fortunate to, be able to operate in this lane a little bit myself but so many people feel like slaves to this lifestyle and this machine that they don't mm-hmm. really want to be part of um but at the same time are unwilling to let go of the the security of that or the, mm-hmm. the momentum of it and it seems like you guys are just setting out anew every day wondering what what's going to happen and sometimes it's good sometimes not so much but you're still alive and your life is richer probably at, you know when you go to bed a little richer at the end of the day for this and um that's just so exciting and inspiring you know just to hear you t- talk about it and your paintings i'm i'm sure are getting better and your friend circle is kind of getting better you're attracted like you said these weird people are coming up to you i'm one of them and mm-hmm. um you know, now you're like in some guy's house looking at Elvis's Christmas card, and it's it's, yeah. it's incredible. And um, so I have a question, which is that: is there a, a goal here? Is there a plan? Is there like a if you could write your own ticket five years from now, what would you want this to look like? Or is it just to let the chips fall where they may, and every day be what it is? it's get better every day just just get better and learn and but there are i have a we have a friend that's a firefighter here matt and he's like what are your goals and so (laughs) he's always asking that because he wants to paint and he's painting he's really good and uh but it's like hitting all the small goals thinking about the large goals and and hitting in the middle and then working up and for me that that's going towards studio painting Mm -hmm. more 
and taking these notes because uh, I'm more interested in that kind of thing and some more figurative work and then just the plein air and uh, the plein air is wonderful and uh, it's a wonderful endeavor just in, in and of itself if you know, if that's all you do. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of, it's... I think for me, it's just to have a consistent body of work. You know, it's um, not not to become a shapeshifter. And I know some people at the label of creative is like, well, I can, but I want my work to look like, a you know, Nathan Epting work. You yeah. Know? And um, that's the thing, like, really, I, the one thing I can choose the most e- easily is subject matter. So... It's there's a lot of cliche involved in in plein air painting. Um, in you know, what sense? It, there well, it, it, there's a, it's kind of a homes and gardens kind of um, uh, thing mm-hmm. that, that that emerges, and there's nothing wrong with it. But there's um, what is telling me? I don't know what that means. I mean, I know at homes home and gardens. gardens I know it's, it's a magazine, but what does that mean? In well, terms in, of in I guess in uh, terms we talk in, there's people that paint. Uh, to the market, what we mm. say, and that is like I want to paint something that somebody would, you know, something that's cute or something that mm-hmm. is, you know, this is has some intrinsic value, you know, as far as um, I mean, if you look, I mean, there's so many flowers and there's so many, uh, you know, and I and I'm I'm more interested like in in old cars or mm-hmm. in uh, lately I've been painting around rail yards, so and that. That's not going to interest a lot of uh, people that in the market, so to speak. But you're, you're not being led by a commercial consideration. No, 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 yes. no. It's because it's it's not inspiring. I mean, it's like it's it's soul crushing to have to paint yeah. <laughs> something you don't want. You know, yeah. so rather you, drive truck. Rather drive a truck, just like Ricky Nelson. That's what I would do. But when you look at um, a lot of the the regional painters, if you look like the Ashcan School we just been talking about they painted more just like today what's contemporary you know the, out in the neighborhood it might be industrial you know they did they painted a lot around industrial cities like pittsburgh and all and i look at their paintings and i see shapes and color and form and composition and and a lot of um just daily life and 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 planner painter societies around here you you can almost like, am I looking at something that was painted in the 1800s, you know, because everything is so bucolic. Mm-hmm. And Meadows, that, a lot of times there's not, and evidence, yeah. and there's not even evidence of human activity. Mm-hmm. And, right. um, and and there's a definitely, like you said, there's a place for that. Right. And, and I do look at, there are paintings where it's just beauty for beauty's sake. It's a sunset. It's a mountain. And we find ourselves in these situations and paint it. Yeah. But it's. Um, but I can't paint pretty, man. It's like I always mm-hmm. tell him. It's like there's there's a thousand people doing a great job at that. So mm-hmm. it's uh, more like find find what interests you. But hopefully, over time, it it it's all in a body of work where it looks related, mm-hmm. and um, it, it looks like it goes together. Yeah, we were talking this morning about uh, Willie Nelson, and it came up, and it's just how he was always either behind or ahead. I'm not. I don't know the music. He's just off kilter. And the discovery recently of uh, Floyd, more recently, Floyd Tillman, who most people don't remember, but it's just a little off center, uh, that music and all, but there's something there where it's like, it really jumps out. He's talking about the phrasing. The mm-hmm. fra- Yeah, the way it's phrased, that that's a big part of it. But uh, what did you say the, the he's he like stole something from tillman oh willing the crazy if you go listen there's a floyd tillman song and and this is the randomness of both of us in our brains and if you have a conversation and walk up you don't know i mean just back away slowly if you need to (laughs) but uh there's a floyd tillman song i gotta have my baby back and if you listen to the when he his first line in there crazy willie nelson's crazy and it's the whole we get into the ecclesiastical kind of thought of there's nothing new under the sun and that's a real challenge as an artist yeah. songwriter writer painter but there it is and there's crazy and you think crazy is this monolith of and it is but it's nothing new under the sun right there the first baby that floyd tillman says in 19 i think 49 and baby. willie nelson he does not another quote willie nelson yeah. says i'm probably the greatest, the biggest Floyd Tillman fan in the world. And I love both. <laughs> and thank God for, for both of them. Uh-huh. And um, 
in their art. But that's that's kind of what he's talking about there. It's uh, there's something there, and and people will and do connect with that, and they are looking for that. So uh, there's this great Thelonious Monk quote: "A genius is the one most like himself." And um, I've thought about that a lot, and I've thought about it. It's just been kind of a mantra because you know I'm looking for this my version of the same exact thing. I want. Um, a, I want a Corby song or short story to feel like a Corby song or short story. And man, that is hard. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I want weirdly I want, hard to right. say be yourself. I want to paint a painting that I want to buy. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's that, it. That, God, that is so, I was just thinking about yeah. that this morning. I'm like back to the writing thing and I'm just like freaking out. Part of my problem is I just love the classics so much. And I just read all the Russians and stuff as a young man. <laughs> I can't write like that. I like it's just mm-hmm. like the it's so great. It's so great. If you read Paradise Lost, you're just like it's already done. Don't try. Um, but then still, you have this yearning yeah. to do your own thing. And That's so, right. how do you knowing that you won't be a, like you can, you'll never be up there in this stratosphere? It's like okay, maybe just don't worry about being great. Just just be good. Just be one of the many many good, keep, <laughs> and then be yourself. Keep, you know? keep doing what you're doing. And we I don't know who said it. And we have a lot of those. I don't know who said it, but we'll say it. And you've said it. Um, if you you're not going to catch a wave if you're not in the water, and so that's the keep going. Somebody looked that up. I don't know where. Yeah, another going. word that's come up before. I've heard people in, in painting is like mileage. Like uh-huh. you have to. Like it's so. Um, you you just you have to have so many miles of this. You have to burn through so much material in order to figure out a process Mm -hmm. and and process is really important Mm -hmm. i think uh you don't want to um get into a formula but you want to hone a process where you can get yourself into the range more consistently the more consistently you can get in a certain range the higher probability that you're going to have keepers, you know, Mm -hmm. and things that are, that are significant work to you and other people. Mm -hmm. But if you're not out there, I mean, if you really don't paint a lot, there's, when I went through in my education, there was just a lot of shop talk. There's a lot of people that sat around and talked and they referenced names and they referenced, you know, the his art history, which is really, it's, it's a huge part to know that. But the actual you doing things, I mean, and it's dawning when you figure out that when you talk to older people that you admire, they're like, you just have to paint all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't paint all the time and if you get distracted by your social life or, I mean, you do have to sacrifice for your family. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those things, you have to carve out time and, and consistently or else you will rust. You'll rust out and you'll get lethargic (laughs) Mm -hmm. so there's a way that you have to figure out how to trick yourself sometimes into being enthusiastic and you know you know you're not going through the motions but you're entering a process that you've already developed Mm -hmm. and but don't let that turn into formula yeah that's that's the tricky part of that never let that turn into formula maybe we can uh you got some paintings queued up Uh uh-huh let's 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 pull a judd one up is this a good place to start yeah okay um so maybe talk about this but also imagine that somebody's not be able being able to see this um because i don't want to lose our uh, our audio friends too much but um so this is this would be representative of like late late work um late but not too late this is the summer or, okay. or late spring, early summer. And this is, uh, we're looking at a painting from Radnor Lake, Otter Creek Road. And it's just responding to, uh, to what I'm seeing there. Um, there are people passing through and I don't have that represented in the painting, but just trying to get this, uh, this sense of, you know, when I close my eyes, what I think of Radnor Lake and walking there, a walk there. And, and that's what I'm wanting to portray. And, uh, it's not, said earlier eloquently as possible loose and as simply as possible and that's that, greatly simplified this painting is greatly greatly simplified right and as few brush strokes as possible and uh yeah yeah um you don't have uh painting nate from the same day do you 
to you? Uh, that's not on me. I, I, okay. I guess I guess it's for that would be really interesting to do it like a side by side. But um, mm-hmm. well, let's just go through a couple. Um, cue up the next one, Kyle. Uh, should we do a Nathan next? Sure. This oh, I, lo- is, I love this one, man. That that this is an Airstream trailer. I'm not gonna. I'm sorry to jump on you, but that like the metal is flying off. <laughs> the can I don't know how you that's, do that. That's recent. Um, I, I anybody listening to the podcast that knows painting, there's a there's a painter in California named Tim Horn. Is it Tim Horn? Tim Horn. Tim Horn. And uh, they he's he's painted Airstream trailers, and uh, but this is not exactly I don't think how he would have handled. But I, one of my influences is a guy that really simplifies things for painting in a great way and simplifying is definitely like one it's a high compliment when mm. when I talk about simplification this is here in East Nashville and it's family that recently moved here from California that and never happens it's kind of in an alleyway <laughs> it's in it's in an alleyway so uh, they came out in great great folks and just really took an interest I painted it two or three times so I've got two or three paintings that I've done from that but it's uh, when you deal with reflection, you, you you can suggest things. You there's a certain mentality where you would start describing things like, oh, there's an outline of a house, and you could go into that kind of detail. But where do you want the eye to move around? And um, I mean, there's a there's just a very bright white object behind me that was reflecting, and then very late in this painting, the sun was making its arc and all the light came off of that and it was so much more pleasing. I mean, it was just like really, um, there was a lot of treble in that painting. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that it would seem like a huge part of the challenge with plein air and especially with something as reflective as surfaces, an Airstream <laughs> trailer would be the changing yeah. angle of the sun. Changes constantly, but it was, there was a totally different value thing going on and I made some late adjustments when that wall didn't receive all the light and it made a big difference and it, it made me happy with the painting because it was uh it was kind of it was fighting with my eye and i think with anybody that would look at it but do you yeah. have do you have that one or did you sell it or? i do still have that painting yeah i do have it it's uh 16 by 20 inches so it's that's large for plein air a lot of people work um 11 by 14 or smaller mm-hmm. eight by 10 is like a real popular size but that's I tend to work large, so mm-hmm. I like to work large with big brushes and kind of um, keep things uh, loose and descriptive. Fire up one of them Judd ones. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, we call this thing our our hay bale. We both have a lot of paintings of this car. Uh, Claude Monet painted hay bales and a lot in, in return to those that were behind his home there in, in uh, rural France. But this is over near Belmont. If you're familiar, familiar with Nashville and a lot of people are familiar with this car, a lot of people use that road, unfortunately, as a cut through. And so uh, this car is uh, owned by a gentleman who, I think it was his first car. I've gotten to know him and his wife, uh, Victor and Christy, and just wonderful people. They didn't call the police when we showed up. And uh, we always joke with people about that. Thanks for not. But yeah, I love that little car, and I love the fact that he's held on to it. And, wow. um, and it's, it's an old Beetle. Old Beetle. It's, I think it's a 55. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really cool. He, he has a son that's been learning to drive stick shift and nearly uh, tore up. I think they burned out the clutch. I think they did burn out the clutch. Yeah. But he's, it, uh, the car is better. <laughs> it was gone for a while. We went by, and it was like, oh, man. Right. It's, it's better now. But well, Beetle, you can replace that in an afternoon, I think. But. <laughs> I guess so, but we paint range. that in all all kind of conditions and seasons, and I have a bunch of them. And uh, kind of like if it. if everything fell through one day, we just like, well, we're close enough. Let's drop by there. That's right. Yeah. yeah if we, it, it's funny story. I painted it the first time I ever painted that car was the best time I ever painted that car, and I had a show maybe three weeks later, and um, it sold before the show so there was um, a lady that came through and she said i know i know the guy who owns that and she just took a picture and sent it to him and uh 
So he, he, I got commissioned to do a painting of that car for Christmas, which is really, it's a big honor to, to somebody commissions you to paint based off another painting. But it was really a, it's really a, a neat place and a, and a, and the car is like neutral colored. So mm-hmm. it's like the biggest challenge is it looks so different in different lightings, different time of day. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it looks very different. It's kind of like a Jerry finish, Seinfeld. Yeah. When you finish the painting, it looks very different and you, and it's, that's the challenge. And the, the design of the, of the old Beatles as well, there's these arcs that are going around and I could see them, you know, going a different way. You, you look at the fenders and just getting all that in the drawing challenge in and of itself mm-hmm. it's wonderful it's a wonderful study and um victor if you hear this don't leave it there just leave it <laughs> we'll be back and we are we're back uh, probably once a month on average um for that car that's great let's see yeah. i really am enjoying this this talk i think this is going to be plenty interesting to people even if they can't see the paintings and you can just check out the paintings um just by going to the Morse code podcast on YouTube or uh, seeing Nathan and Judd's Instagrams. Anyway, I digress. What are we looking at? We're looking at a commission. I get commissioned to paint houses a lot. So this is a, a home here in Nashville that I painted and just uh, went by one afternoon. And it's always sometimes it's like we'll wait till such such flowers are blooming or whatever but these people weren't particular and uh, it's really a neat home and i didn't notice until afterwards that that is basically my grandmother's house in reverse Mm -hmm. and it was pointed out to me and um i'm like dang it really is (laughs) oh it screamed at me the first time i saw it it's just completely reversed so i was i was more uh, nervous about the painting and getting it done but always be kind of significant looking back at it because it fooled me you know the the layout of it but mm-hmm. i do a lot of a lot of homes and um a lot of older homes and really love doing that mm-hmm. so that's yeah. probably that's probably a 16 by 22. we're hitting our rhythm now guys okay yeah this is right around the corner from from where we are um this is uh, a a small painting in a small brush and uh, this was one of those days where I just wasn't feeling it at all. And I was hanging on to dear life for Nat's manic pursuit of no- nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it was whatever he was looking for. <laughs> but um, I got out and I, I painted anyway. It was one of those. And it's one of my favorite recent paintings. The house uh, was built in 1910. Uh, I've actually painted a previous painting of the same house that the owner of the house saw and wanted to buy and uh so he hasn't seen this one but this house was built in around 1910 and it's really interesting when you look at it and you get up close and um it was built by a doctor and the top the third floor um it basically named the house it was called bell's view he could see downtown nashville from up there and people who knew it are he was a doctor, so half the house he lived in and the other half it's divided or was down the middle. Um, office on one side, living quarters on the other. It's a large house now, now that it's all combined. But uh, just really, really interesting house, and it's got a neat little thing. It's got a, a thing on the door, um, a speaking tube, which I was unfamiliar with, and he had quarters upstairs where he could take a call at late hours when he's you know having his cigar and bourbon and um, they could speak and it's a concrete tube that runs through the house to the study and he could determine whether or not he needed to take this person as a patient or tell him to come back the next day Mm. and so just Just by the sound of the what was oh it it, it was just like a phone call it was like a conversation he said if you if you came in and listened to it you would you would hear you just sit there and you talk in and you listen. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I'd never heard of that before, but he said it was concrete, cast concrete tube that went all the way through and up. And I just, he said, it just sounds like the person standing next to you. Wow. So you find out things like that, little details and things you never knew about. And uh, so, yeah, Bell's View. Bell's View. Our, I recognize this is a Skylark Cafe. Yeah, this Sky Blue. I think, Sky Blue. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd eaten there, I guess, pre-pandemic, and then they went to where they um, for a while they weren't taking cash, and I was uh, 
I had this thing going on in my bank. It's 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 going to sound unreasonable, stupid to other people, but I was just like just using cash because uh, I didn't want to use any of my cards, and so I couldn't go there to eat. And I and I was complaining. This girl came out and she wanted to look look at my painting, and I said, "Well, I, I used to eat there." And she said, "Well, come on back in." I said, "Well, I you know you don't take cash," and she said, "Yeah, we do. We went back to taking cash." So that's a great place to go for breakfast, and uh, over in in Edge Edge Field. Interesting thing is, right across the street, up a few houses, is the house that Frank James, or was it Jesse James? Yeah, Frank, it's, uh, Frank James lived there. Can't remember one of them. Yeah, they took a they took a hiatus from their crime and and tried to blend in in Nashville, and so you it's there. There's no marker. It's a little tiny red house. It's tiny. Two floor house, seven eleven. Right, and and uh, it, I think that was Frank and Jesse lived the street over. Uh, was it basketball? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, this where that the, section of basketball, he uh, lived there, and it didn't work out for him. They couldn't, they couldn't they follow couldn't the straight era. No, this would have been what early twentieth century. Gosh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. early. He had a son that lived into the nineteen seventies, and the son talked about living here. Huh. So um, they, it's in the books. I mean, you can read about it. But they lived here under assumed names, and they had a home, a place up in White's Creek that is marked. There's a marker out in front of this place, kind of on the boondocks. Wow. Uh, also, just um, props to you that the cafe is not in the center of the frame. Yeah. <laughs> he made a, no, it's not. Compositional choices is, there. This is idiosyncratic for other reasons, though. And uh, but I I did have it off center. I was interested in kind of the depth, looking down the street, and uh, just the sky, and trying to. A lot of times, people are like, "Why do you paint like utility poles and everything?" And I'm like, "That's a it's a really good opportunity for cadence to have some kind of a rhythm going back." And I didn't really get that here. It, to, to the degree that you can. But um, I remember when I painted this, it was really hot. It was like 97 degrees. Mm. So it's very, very hot. And it's one of those days where um, there's just a lot of quit in you. <laughs> but I, I got that far. And um, I think maybe to the degree there is simplification, <laughs> it's because of the weather. Yeah, I was going to say, so the, this maybe was a situation in which weather determined the length of uh, yep. the effort. Um, but other, you know, absent that, how do you know when to stop? Uh, that's something you just have to learn yeah. in time. It's like um, you kind of express things to the degree like, you, you know, one thing I was always told is keep your brush moving and, and work. Don't piecemeal, work everything, get everything going simultaneously when you're dealing with, you know, different elements. So you're always trying to establish value in the in the early and that's your dark to light. And if you don't if you get something thrown off with value, a lot of people say value uh, does all the work and color gets all the credit. <laughs> and in and, and this painting, the color is not spectacular. But it was one of these days where you you get confused over. I mean, you look at the street; it can look really, really bright when the sun's on it, or the sky. You know, you have clouds and a lot of light hitting the the clouds. So um, with that one, and you would look at the line of cards. That's that's an that's an example of just suggesting. I mean, it's it's to the far right of this thing, and do you really want somebody looking at that, or do you want them looking over at the store? The old building. Well, I mean, it's East Nashville. You want to see the bumper stickers, man. <laughs> you want to see the bumper stickers, but no, not not to that level of detail. Well, to me, and I'm not sophisticated, so to the untrained eye, you know, my eye immediately just goes to the bright door. The and door, I, yeah. Yeah, then that, I would think the, that maybe that was your intention. I guess that's the namesake of the restaurant. It's Sky Blue mm. Cafe, and I, I always want to say Blue Sky, but if you look at it, it's on their all their menu and everything. It's Sky Blue. Mm -hmm. And just a neat little uh, small business. Great place for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Put a plug in for him. Another East Nashville charm. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, this is mine. This is this Judd speaking here. Uh, this is uh, one of our parts of Nashville. People think this is Southern California, but this is one of our build a better box communities. Yeah. And uh, this is Sylvan. Is it Sylvan Heights, Nat? Yep. Yeah, this is looking west and out over glorious and sophisticated West Nashville. And <laughs> um, just the rooftops I was seeing that day, um, just the brilliance of the light and glare. It was There was so much glare. And... Uh, Another thing I really remember was there was an athlete that was running this hill and the sense of steep, how steep this hill was. He ran it four or five times while I'm there. It's a sprinting. long hill. He was sprinting. And it was one of those days like Nat with this, this blue sky, sky blue. Yeah, cafe. it was hot. It was brutal. Nat was behind me painting the other way. And uh, But anyway, it just the way it came out was, uh, it was just how I envisioned it. One of those where, and it was another day where, I just wasn't feeling it at all getting out there and it was just another another example and I have so many of just keep painting. Um, it almost looks like Cyprus or you know it's all, there's uh, something about it. Yeah, yeah, it could be like an island in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yep. It's weird and it's uh yeah, it's and it was trying to it's amazing seeing these houses and the, how close they are together and the people agree uh in the in the, these new neighborhoods and to um, but anyway, it's interesting. It, it takes all sorts. And I have that Jeep down there parked coming towards me and just try to indicate that as quickly as possible. But to populate it a little bit. It's a box, too. Mm hmm Yeah. Let's just do a couple more, Kyle. Maybe one each. One more each. That's yeah, White Oak Farm. That's um, a little place down in Williamson County. And this is along the new, um, I guess, the Mac Hatcher. Where Del Rio Pike area. Yeah, Del Rio Pike. But they're going to bring, they've already brought Mac Hatcher through. And there's this, it's all farmland out there, but it's going to be subdivided and there's going to be houses. Mm -hmm. But it's it's like quintessential Middle Tennessee. And it's it's just a, endangered, very endangered. But um, I've got a phobia about the sky that that's like, Last summer, I was like, I'm going to figure out how to get comfortable expressing whatever's going on in the sky. So this was one of these paintings I felt like worked. And uh, it was one of those days where I don't know how many people are cloud watchers, but if you're in a car on a long trip and you have really dramatic skies, I love looking at clouds. Man. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So this is one of those days where it was just really ideal. It's like, let's go somewhere and try to paint the sky. This is probably within the last month, right? Yeah, this is like a month ago, maybe. Yeah, and I don't even know how your mind does that because that's another situation that's yep. dynamic and you're freezing it in time. And it so calls you're kind on, of, yeah, it calls on a sense of design, which is not my strong point. Mm. And uh, design is like you, everything I've heard suggested is you establish big shapes and you don't deviate. You begin to look around for things that if you want, reference for different color and value and tone you look other parts of the sky and bring it back to your original design so it, it's improvised you know mm -hmm. it's just uh but I, i've never felt really confident doing that it's always kind of you'll look back there was a period where i painted and people were like man there's no sky in your paintings mm -hmm. it's all like trees and and you can do that in nashville because this there's we got so many trees but that place was uh really a magical and I, and I hope somebody with a lot of money can put that in a trust or something. This this piece of land right this here. This piece of yeah, land, I really do. I, there's and a painting. Okay. There's a group <laughs> for for our listeners. There's a group called the um, the Cumberland Painters mm -hmm. here. That it's maybe like five or six, but they're, they're well established, and they do a lot of painting. Uh, they sell for conservancy for land conservancy. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's something I think. Growing up here, we've taken for granted, but you see great pieces of land that are formerly great pieces of land. They're just divided out for I remember track, track housing. Cool Springs, for example, I remember it being a cow pasture. Yeah. Just some cow pasture with a spring out there. You're that old. Yeah, well, yeah. Every bit <laughs> that I'm old. Yeah. So we just got three more of Judd's. Got this. Let's let's just uh, yeah pick one and the pick two, one that you want to talk with the about. The figurative, um, that one, but both my parents, our parents are in both of them. This is uh, 
this is a portrait I've been working on for a couple of years. This is a study I've done on some pencil studies as well. But um, just kind of getting close. We're, we're really close family, and uh, we're the only sons, only children in the family. But uh, we're kind of getting to the point of, of looking after them and their, the situation and is that. And kind of just seeing just the beauty of, of them and, and their relationship. They've been married for 55, six years. Is this the... Is the house meaningful? Uh, the it's the, uh, they, they, they built, they bought it in 68 and they haven't moved. Everybody else yes. kind of moved away. And, and you guys uh, grew up in this house then? We grew up there. Yeah. yeah. And that's out on their screen porch, which, which was an addition. And this is just a typical scene that you see with them and how I want to remember them in mm-hmm. this time. And um, so there's not a lot of detail. I'm just kind of taking notes. And uh, you see the tomatoes, those are tomatoes on the rail. When that mm-hmm. whole rail gets filled with tomatoes, they, they can tomatoes. They'll mm-hmm. put them up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's in the summer. It's like a, gradually you have ripening tomatoes all around and you know, have a, animals yeah. will come in and knock them off or whatever. But There's a lot of tenderness in that painting. I there mean, is. It's, uh, they're, they're having some quiet time in reading there. And there, there's... Uh, it's, it's just... A, that's a very common scene with them. And um, so... This is the direction I'm kind of headed, I think, in more figurative uh, people doing their thing, living their lives uh, in our time, in our real time. And it's it's very scary and challenging uh, when you're dealing with a Mago day like this, especially when it's your parents. And uh, But at any rate, I've got a large canvas with this drawn on, uh, loosely washed on paint that I'll paint over and, and, and paint with uh more detail and i don't want to get just too rigid with that and i want to keep this loose quality from the study and this is uh the painting of uh, my parents i drove them to west tennessee and some friends of theirs of probably 50 50 plus years and uh i drove them out there for a day and i happened to have the paint in the back of the car and uh and i thought well they're gonna sit here and talk for a while and so on the right you see my painting it's kind of hard to tell this is one shot on the it's on my panel holder and then on the left that's the that's them back there in the background and this they're just a photo of the painting fo- on yeah. the stand on the easel right and then the subject behind it behind it so you're just seeing the you don't really see the stairs leading up you see a little bit of that entering and it's a pathway into the painting and they're there and there's very little detail um it's just the overall essence of what was going on and uh that day and uh it was just a, it was a wonderful experience except that right at the end where their friends um the the wife uh it's like i thank you so much for doing this painting and leaving this with me and i'm like no (laughs) no this is at that point it was the best painting i've ever painted Mm -hmm. that feeling and it and so i I, at some point i want to make like a a a print or a g clay and uh for for them and um better hurry hey and uh but anyway so that's it and uh love it um this is great. I hope this translates to the audio people. And um, again, just check it out on YouTube. Uh, one last little train of thought. We've gone a little bit over an hour, but do you? How do people connect with you guys? Uh, more mostly, like, are do you have any shows coming up? Because you should. People need to be more aware of what you're doing. And I participate um, in the Franklin Art Crawl, which is first Friday night and um, every month. Okay. And it's intermittent for me. You know, it's like if I have pieces, new pieces, I'm excited about. And uh, maybe by the time this is aired, I'll have my website completely built out and be able to give you a link for that. Yeah. So, but Instagram is, is kind of like a running vlog of kind of what's on the easel. So, That's great. And people, yeah. um, I mean, you are available for commission or I, I don't want to, you know, oversell it or whatever, make you uncomfortable. It just... uh if I think that people will be interested and want to support and hopefully there'll be opportunities right. for them yeah. to do that. It just, uh, it all depends on whether, you know, things match up, you know, philosophically, you know, uh-huh. I always try to make sure people look through my paintings and know that you're getting a, 
impressionist, you know, and it's not going to be extremely tight or whatever, you yeah. know, kind of work, you know. So, and and if it's in my wheelhouse and I feel like I can do a strong painting, yeah, I jump into it. That's great. And sometimes you get into periods where it's like I'm not taking commissions right now, you know. I just want to go out and paint. Yeah. Instagram for me is the place. And what and is that again, Judd? Instagram. I know, but oh, what's J.W. Your... Epting, my li- our J-W last name, E P T I N N G J W on the front. And we'll throw that. You, you'll be able to see the names yeah. in your on your but, audio platform, and then if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the comments. Like um, I like I did say, I'm interested in going the figurative route, and if if uh, and if someone wanted to reach out to me and. Um, like he said, if there's philosophically things work out, I, I'm interested in in listening to all takers. Um, that's gr- great to hear. Uh, I will say that I don't know a lot about painting, and this has been a fascinating conversation. I really, really enjoyed it, and I'm so grateful to you guys for awesome. making a little time for me. That's yeah. great. We don't know a whole lot about painting either. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do it again soon. All awesome, right. Man. All right. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. Click the like and subscribe button if you wouldn't mind. You can click over here to watch another complete episode or click here to watch a playlist of the songs of the Morse Code podcast. You know you want to. You know you want to. You know you want to.